Good morning, everybody. This is Anne Swain here. It is Tuesday, the 2nd of June. I want to welcome you to the APSCO Question Time, where I have a great panel with me. Um, let me introduce you to that panel. Most of you will recognise Tanya Bowers, who is the Group Legal Counsel for APSCO. And Tanya actually works um, for us with regard to the lobbying of uh, MPs and of ministers and dealing with civil servants to find out and to help make decisions about how business should work in the UK, whether it's from a taxation point of view or indeed things more relevant at the moment like the job retention scheme. And so it's right in the middle of the, that decision making group. We also have Terry Buckle. Terry I know very well. He was on our trade delegation to New York and to Canada. Canada. Don't know if he's still looking at setting up in one of these two because that was at the tail end of last year and hey pressed happened at the beginning of this year. Terry is the founder and the MD of Astute Technical Recruitment. Terry actually is well known to Apsco because he runs our Southern Regional Forum as the chair of that and we know that business very well. Based in Portsmouth, it's really in the energy and the utilities market and he actually came from a background in the Royal Navy as a marine engineer before setting the business up. It's focusing realistically I suppose for perm and contract in an engineering and an operational side of things in that energy and utilities business. Um, astute uh, turnover about 14 million pounds a year. Certainly they did before COVID-19. We'll find out what they think they're gonna do this year and has around 50 people within the business. Terry, thank you for coming in and welcome to you. Um, let me also introduce Andrew Anastasiou, or my husband, who is Greek, actually, would prefer me to say Anastasiou, but let's go the English way, specifically <laughs> from Andrew, who's been pretty obviously brought up here. Um, Andrew is the um, MD of Pertemps Professional and uh, Professional Recruitment, and he's also a main board director of the whole of the network group of Pertemps as well. His um, background is recruitment through and through originally i think in the edu engine uh, sorry educational sector plus covers these days sorry? i was a I was a, I was a secondary school teacher a secondary school teacher Fantastic. a long time ago I bet the kids couldn't pronounce your name either so mm. as a as a secondary school teacher he's come into the profession of recruitment but a long time ago and it's hugely experienced from that point of view and of course per temps is a slightly meaty company i would say the group itself will turn over coming up to a billion pounds and has around two thousand members of staff a big well-known group business um, and it's I think one of the largest independent recruitment companies within the UK so that's a meaty sized right. business it goes across the full range of specializations whether it be health social care education obviously accounting and finance IT construction and engineering and the whole build environment um, again working from a temp point of view contract point of view and of course on a permanent basis Andrew, welcome to you. Thank you both of my yeah. uh, member panel members for joining us. And thank you again to Tonya for coming back again and covering this for us. What I would say is there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. It's better for me if the questions come in earlier on and I can juggle them around. I'm telling everybody in our panel members that I'm a bit like a DJ. I quite like to bring so smoochy ones in toward the end and the disco numbers in the middle while I'm warming you up with a bit of traditional soul. So if you want questions, put them through preferably on the chat box. We will see them and I will endeavour to get through all of those questions as we do this session. We finish at 12 o'clock pretty much on the dot, which means, you know, don't leave it to three minutes to 12 when I might have 100 and can't get them through. Why don't we go to the questions to start off? And I've got some to kick off. Um, 
I think an important one and probably something that's, that's going to flow a bit actually today is going to be to do with the job retention scheme. Obviously changes have been announced to that. Tanya, can I come to you? When will HMRC publish updated rules on the job retention scheme? And maybe you can explain to me what the Chancellor Rishi Sunak said um, only just as to what's going to happen with the changes coming up. Okay, so there's going to be more detailed guidance on um, the 12th of June. So we've um, had a statement from the Chancellor last Friday. So I think the key point initially, which I think is causing a bit of confusion and actually confused me initially, is who will be entitled to remain on furlough as of the 1st of June. The key point is you won't be able to furlough anybody for the first time after the 1st of July. So they, and, so they have to already have been furloughed before the 1st of July. So this means if you have somebody now that's never been furloughed before, then the last date you can put them on the furlough is the 10th of June because of the three week period that they have to be on furlough for the furlough to kick in and apply and for you to be able to claim it back. It wasn't totally clear from his announcement, but I think it has now been clearer in guidance that HMRC has it quite short guidance, but, but wording that HMRC has issued, that as long as somebody has been on furlough for a three week period, at any point during the furlough scheme before the 1st of July, then you will be able to furlough that person after the 1st of July through to the end of October. So, so that's the key point about who you will be able to continue to furlough after the 1st of July. The second right. point is how they'll be able to work after the 1st of July. There'll be a lot more flexibility. You will either be able to have them working for you or have them on furlough. For days that they are working for you, you will pay them 100% just as you would normally. For days they're not working for you, that they would normally work, then they can, you can claim back on the furlough scheme and that continues to be 80% up, up to a maximum of 2,500 per month. So that's the key difference. If they're working for you, you pay them 100% as normal. If they're not working for you and on furlough, then you can con continue to claim under the scheme. And there's a sliding scale, but I'm conscious it might be easier to cover that later, Anne, because otherwise it's a bit of a monologue. So up to you. Do you want me to cover the sliding okay. scale now? No, I'll a bit later. I also yeah, I also understand there's... Uh, later on from August there's going to be some involvement with us paying national insurance and pensions I'll come back to that a bit later on otherwise you're right but I do know that people are interested in the answers to those as well okay so furlough changes to furlough um, let me come to to you guys on our panel Andrew have you furloughed people within Pertex the business Absolutely, we have. Yes. Um, obviously, the organisation, the size that it is, had no choice but to furlough the individuals and a vast majority of our workers are currently being furloughed. Um, the plan for us now what is... What percentage would you say? You say vast majority. What kind of percentage have you got? Uh, I, I, I would say probably around 40% of our workforce is currently being furloughed. Okay. Yeah, there's okay. quite, quite, quite a majority, quite, quite a large number of being furloughed. The challenge, of course, for us is, is, is how do we get these individuals, these members of staff back into work, bearing in mind that the furlough scheme has been extended, but also the government guidelines are now saying, look, we should be trying to create business back to normal. We're keen as, a, as an organisation, as a group, to get back to working uh, full time, and we are preparing ourselves to reintroduce some of those furloughed workers back into uh, the mainframe. The challenge, of course, for a business. Can, yeah. 
Can yeah. I ask, yeah. did you furlough about 40% all in one go? Did you do it gradually? How? Let's look at the beginning of that furlough scenario. And I'll come back later if okay. it's okay about the future. Sorry. But from a furlough point of view, did you furlough them all in one big batch? We furloughed a considerable amount in the initial uh, period, but then we continued to review the different businesses, um, you know, the different sections, divisions that we've got within the group. And obviously, as and when we felt it was right, uh, those individual business leaders then took the decision to start furloughing those, uh, for those, those, those uh, members of staff. Um, what it felt like really at the time was that a considerable amount of them had been furloughed to start with, but then a gradual furloughing of the rest of the staff. We've now not furloughed anyone and we don't intend to furlough anyone moving forward. Okay. Um, Terry, can I come to you with regard to this furlough scenario? What kind, have you have you furloughed anybody within the business? Yes, we have. Um, we um, yeah, we, we've furloughed about a third of people. So um, you know, fifty, we've got about 15, 16 people uh, on furlough. Um, it's, it's a mix of. I uh, see the questions that you've asked, Andrew, as well. So uh, we 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 started with a number at the beginning. There were some roles, uh, some functions, you know, we're one office, so there were some functions in the office that were not going to be needed um, as we then went into lockdown. And then over a period, um, I would say we've had two other um, milestones as such where um, some people have decided that they, uh, it would suit their, them better, i.e. With, uh, with, with, you know, uh, childcare um, issues and, and, you know, mothers of kids and homeschooling, and it worked out well. Um, and others just been unable to um, to cope really as well. So to help as, as best we can, um, you know, with, with everyone's mental health, but to, if, if they're struggling working from home, some people in a literally in a bed sit and that's all they have. Um, and to be able to try and work from there as well as live there and not be able to leave the house. So we've taken each case individually and we've done everything for the right reasons. Uh, but yeah, at the minute we're about a third of, of total staff. So in furloughing with, with both of you guys, in furloughing a number of staff, how do you think this last two or three months has panned out with regard to the figures for the business? Terry, how's the business doing? How's it doing at this stage in the year compared to what your budget forecast would have been? It's, it's well, it's, it's behind where we would have been without this, of course. Um, but when we went into this, we could see and we planned for worst case scenario. And um, we're doing better than worst case scenario, which is which is pleasing to see. We're, we're fortunate that our sectors are uh, majority of key workers, sort of in energy utilities. You know, we have to keep the lights on. People are still working. A lot of operational facilities. So we're fortunate in that respect, um, and we're doing better than we 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 planned, and we're doing better than we expected. Really, um, a bit of a positive. Um, and but I certainly appreciate that you know not everybody's in the same uh, situation as, as ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Andrew, if I come to you, especially I suppose a lot of your business is going to be in the public sector, realistically. How has the public sector fared, or your bit of the public sector fared, with regard to business on the contract side, the temp side, perm side? Yeah, it's been an interesting time for us, similar to Terry, really. We're actually faring a little bit better than we thought we were going to be, actually. We, of course, are behind budget, yes, as a group. But uh, there are definitely sectors within the business, particularly like, for example, in social care. Uh, social workers are in great demand. They're, they're key workers. So businesses like that have actually increased their revenues and continue to grow. But well, there's other sectors like the education business, for example. Most of those, uh, that, well, we all know schools have been closed and have been closed for a number of weeks now and have only just opened yesterday. That is still going to cause a main issue for the, our education team to be able to you know, start to generate revenue and we don't actually see any kind of real potential revenue coming on board until September time. So it's been very much up and down. There've been some divisions that have actually fared very well. Others we've had to pretty much close down. Uh, and so therefore the budget has kind of really balanced itself out. You know, we're confident though that through the year that we'll make strides to ensure that we try and get to where we need to be by the end of year. Yeah. And so from the education point of view, would you say that with schools going back in a partial way and obviously needing to socially distance in schools, are the schools looking for more locum teachers to, to make sure they've only got five, mem uh, five members pupils with them at any one time? Has that caused a, a little surge, would you say? 
No, it hasn't caused any surge. It was a surge that we were hoping to see happen, but that hasn't happened. Um, obviously, we've got to remember that there are full-time teachers who are there that could come in and to support schools. We haven't reached the point where head teachers need to go out and buy services as yet. We're obviously hoping that they will understand that what with only six weeks of this term to go before the summer break, they need to start looking at what they're going to do for September. And that's the real critical piece for our education divisions is really understanding what are schools in the primary and the secondary sector going to do about September. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're, for, we, we're kind of forecasting probably a little bit of business at this side of the summer break, but I think our main focus and any revenues that will be coming in will be from September onwards. Yeah. Terry, can I come to you? I mean, as a, a decent sized business, £14 million turnover, so that's a, yeah, a, a very decent sized business. How's cash flow been affected and what have you done to mitigate problems with cash flow, which for your size of business, probably a different story if you're turning over nearly a billion pounds, but at 14 million, has cash flow been a big problem for you? Um, certainly a big, um, a big issue to, uh, to plan for. So not just um, the size of business, but also in growth mode. So big plans for 2020. I'm sure a lot of people on the call will resonate with the fact that 2019 was behind us, the Brexit kind of conundrum, the government conundrum, 2020, you know, was, was looking for a really, really good growth year. So we have big plans. Um, obviously, that kind of business plan has been ripped, ripped up and we, we start again to try and uh, at least survive through this. So from a, a cash flow perspective, you know, we've taken advantage of the, um, uh, the, the systems that were in place. So to be able to, you know, defer the VAT, uh, which, which was, you know, quite a big help. Um, we also, um, we're deferring the, the P32 payments. It's really difficult to speak to um, HMRC, so we ended up writing to them, um, and then they ended up contacting us. They haven't received the letters, but you know we, we have an agreement in place. So we're just trying to um, you know ensure that we have enough cash to get through this. For and like and like I say, from what we consider to be worst case scenario, we've, we've actually been better than that. Um, also, we've taken advantage of the the bounce back loan. Um, we started inquiring about the C bills. Um, but we thought at the point we didn't really need to go down that route. But the bounce back loan, it's, you know, we, 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 it's 50k at 2.5% fixed for six years with a year interest free and repay it back after 12 months for, for no cost if you want to. Um, you're never going to get another commercial loan at that <laughs> deal anywhere. So again, um, we took advantage of that. And actually that's kind of put to one side with, uh, with a view to bouncing back. So when we're in a position that we are able to start investing in, in coming back into the office and the business there's a pot of money there for, that hopefully we can use to help us bounce back and that might be to you know help with uh, attract and get somebody um you know to help boss to the team maybe i don't know we'll, we'll see what that looks like um but it was just good planning i, I couldn't have done it without my fd so as, as a growing business it, we i hired an fd two years ago and um without uh, without him i don't think i could have done quite the same as what i've got now so you know, certainly that level of financial strategic information and knowledge really helps a business of my size to be able to have a much more comfortable um, kind of outlook than, than it would have done two years ago for if this had happened then. Yeah, I mean, look, big expansion plans, I know the business does very well. Are you lumbered with an office that's too big? Are you lumbered with anything that was part of the expansion that you've got to be pe paying for even though the expansion might not go ahead at the at the stage that you thought it would yes <laughs> so we uh, we took um, due to the fairly unique location that we're at uh, we've got uh, we had about half of the top floor of this this building in Portsmouth that overlooks a lake it's a place called Lakeside it's a really smart place with a, with its own private um, balcony so we needed some more space to allow us to grow into before uh, somebody took the space next door and we lost it um, and then we couldn't have this, we wouldn't be able to grow. So we took space in advance of needing it. Um, and obviously this is gonna put us back from where we were going into this. So, um, but, but then I guess on the plus side, that gives us more space to be able to social distance properly uh, when we get to the office. So we will be fortunate in that respect. Yeah, um, thank you, Andrew. With regard to your part, particularly part of the business of the group, were there expansion plans afoot? Are things changing on that expansion if there were expansion plans afoot? 
Absolutely, yes, and there was expansion plans. Our plans were to continue to grow in the rate that we have been doing over the past two, three years, and to add further headcount and office space as well. But that's similar to, to Terry, really, that the situation has now changed. You know, I'm viewing things very differently in terms of size of the office that we'll be requiring. I think with sort of pushing on the conversation a little bit in the sense of that, how is that going to look moving forward in terms of how many people we do have actually in the office and who do we have effectively working from home? So our expansion plans may continue, but they will take a different view on it. It will take a twist in terms of how we do that. It won't be the giant office spaces that we've had in the past. It's actually about working smarter around whether we're working at home or we're working uh, at, in an office and basically hot desking. So the um, expansion plan for, for example, there's a particular office in the north that we're developing at the moment. We've signed those contracts that will continue. We're going to do that. Um, we still believe it's the right thing to do for that particular office. So for us, it's going to be a case by case basis on the different areas and we'll make those decisions as and when they, they, they come up. It's difficult, isn't it? Because from a business perspective, not a health perspective, but from a business perspective, some businesses have been hit at the worst possible time by this and others at a less difficult time from a business point of view, just depending on where they are in a cycle. I, I know somebody who's recruited three senior people at great expense for a growing business um, and about to go through a big um, logo change and a big rebrand session. And of course, it, and then boof, everything changed and it was about cutting back and it could be a nightmare time frame or it can be a battle down the hatches, replan, reorganise, and look forward. Um, obviously, but, but we I'll, don't I'll, have I'll people just, working. That, sorry, I was just going to come back on that point. On that point, at the yeah. moment, the COVID had actually uh, had kicked off. What we had done, any kind of particular individuals that were due to start were basically uh, told that were unable to start and had been put onto ice, so to speak. Those people haven't been those offers haven't been withdrawn they're going to at some point be revisited and allowed to come back on and similarly other expansion plans that we did have have been put on hold as well that's what I'm saying by case by case basis really in trying to understand what is right for that particular sector division within the group in terms of its growth and its development really but it has been a challenge and one that I think has got us all really thinking in terms of how do we grow our businesses now and this, this new phrase that everyone is now using, the new normal, what is that going to look like? And how do we respond to it to be an effective recruitment agency to supply what our clients require? And we need to ensure that we are profitable in being able to deliver that. Yeah. I mean, look, obviously you've got 40% of people furloughed. You've got other people working from home. How are you finding teams working from home? Are they working? Are some working harder than others? How are you managing that, Andrew? Yeah, I, I, look, I would say that most of our teams are working from home. There's always going to be one or two who are finding the, you know, sitting on the sound lounge is probably better than actually sitting in front of a laptop, of course. We, the weather's been very kind to us, but I would say that my team in particular have been tremendous in their approach. They've been incredibly dedicated and I've got a lot out of them, really. Um, we were just talking prior to obviously going live this morning and uh, you know you know that time that a consultant will take to travel into London or to any one of our other offices right that hours long journey or the hour long journey going home is now done in front of a laptop so we're actually getting more out of our individuals and that is actually helping us in being able to continue to grow our business in the way that we want um, yeah you're always going to get an individual who is who is going to try and play the game and and it's down to us as as managers as well to uh, ensure that those individuals are brought on board and understand what their responsibilities are and how we get them to actually work effectively with the rest of the team but in general I've been really pleased with the way that the business has progressed during these last 10 weeks. Yeah, good. Terry, what about you and your team? Are you finding people are uh, kind of embracing the working from home ticket or not? Um, in the main, yes. Um, we're, we're, we're very much engaged. So we're using um, uh, Microsoft Teams for regular conversations and chats throughout the day um, for sharing of information. So, um, you know, somebody makes a placement in the office, we have a, an actual gong, get somebody to go up and 
bang it, now we have uh, memes that come up in, uh, in, in your team's chats for, for sales. But for the different teams as well, you know, uh, different projects, you know, that, that, that's working really well for us. Uh, we have a daily get together with everyone on video as well. Uh, finally got um, webcams out to everybody. I think it was uh, last week I delivered a few final webcams myself to people. Um, because obviously when we, this was happening, we don't all have laptops. So we, we you know, move desktops and screens and stands to get people um, uh, working from home. Um, but it's good now at least that we can see everybody. And, you know, again, as Andrew said, people are working a bit more flexible. Um, you're at work, you're at home, it's the same thing. So people are logging on, looking, checking things in the evening, perhaps that maybe before they wouldn't do. Um, so, um, yeah, on the whole, it's been um, the people that are, that are in, in there now are, are, are engaged well. Mm. Yeah, good. Tanya, if it's okay, I might come back to you with there's more questions here with regard to the job retention scheme and changes to that. Um, a question that's come in, does the job retention scheme still work for agency workers after the 1st of July? Um, I'm not, I might be surprised, but nothing I've heard suggests that there's going to be a different scheme or a subset of the scheme for agency workers. So I'm expecting it to continue to be a one size fits all scheme. So on the basis of that, that means that yes, agency workers will continue to be furloughed if, if, if the employer or the agency furloughs them. The issue is there is going to be a sliding scale of contribution from 1st of August, employers must pay national insurance contributions and employer pension contributions. From 1st September, employer must pay 10% of the wages as well as employer con contributions. And from 1st October through to 31st October, the employer will need to pay 20%. So government will pay 60% of wages up to the total to, well, and the employer will pay the other 20%. So there obviously is that question of who's going to actually pay for that level of contribution. And I think unless the government pulls something out of the hat where recruiters can get a grant or can claim a refund, which I'm not expecting, then it's going to be difficult to apply the furlough for agency workers. And also it will be quite difficult to think about how, on, in theory, they could work like employees, they could work a few days a week on an assignment and then be on furlough to take them up to their variable hours salary so to speak for the rest of the week or for however many hours they've got left to take them up to that variable hour limit but again that's quite convoluted and complicated as to how that's going to work so we're very mindful of that we'll obviously be all over it once we get more guidance so that's a bit of a summary yeah. Andrew, you must, with impertence, you've got agency workers. Have they been furloughed or how has it worked with impertence? Yeah, absolutely we have, as, Tang, as Tanya's just been outlining. Yes, we have. We, we took a decision. There was a number of, of workers that needed to be furloughed and we, we followed guidelines that the government had set up, that the Chancellor had offered us. So we took full advantage of those situations and, and furloughed those workers. Yeah, good. And so changes, Tanya, perhaps we'll see what happens with that. My understanding is that if you look at the government website, they talk about once we start paying national insurance uh, contribution, um, that it's about 5% that we are paying, but I'm not sure the figures quite work on that. Do you understand the maths that they're suggesting? Um, no, I was puzzled by that. I've just had a little search because um, pension contribution from the employer is 
um yeah there is the sort of upper limits there are limits before you start paying employers national insurance whether it's something to do with that but no there's nothing i've read that suggested there's this new low rate of employers national insurance that's going to apply oh, okay so, yeah it is confusing isn't it okay so let's just come up with another question and there's another one on furlough actually with the new furlough scheme is it the case that i can bring people back part-time for one day in september two days in october do i pay them full-time rate and then the government makes up the 80 percent how does that work can you bring someone for one day in one month and two days in another yes you can i don't i don't know whether that question was suggesting that somehow that's all you can bring them back that's not true you can bring them back as much or as little as you want from the first of july so if you wanted to bring them back four days a week and they were on furlough one day a week you could do that the key point is when they're working for you you pay them a hundred percent as normal when they're on furlough then initially the government will continue to pay it all but then there's that taper scheme that i've just discussed that will taper off gradually towards the end of october okay. the other point sorry, that I can... I... sorry, sorry. But there's a question that i feel like i should cover in here oh forgotten it um something oh can we make people take pay or can we agree pay cuts for those days they're working for us. That's not the intention uh -huh. of the scheme. The, the, the scheme is very clear that for the days they're working, you should be paying them 100%. And, and I'd, there's no mention of pay cuts, but I mean, in reality, to agree a pay cut, an employee needs to consent. And this, this, is, this is an unequal situation here. So I don't think that's the solution. I think you just have to keep, if you can't afford to pay them, then you need to keep them on furlough for more days in the week and only have them working for you when you can agree afford to pay them, because that's the point of furlough. Yeah, well, sounds a bit as though someone's trying to take the mickey out of the system, which I don't know about you guys, but I think the government have tried to be fair and help businesses and help to save jobs? What do you think, Andrew? Do you think Absolutely. the government have tried to do a good job from a business perspective? Let's forget the health side for the minute, but the business side. Absolutely, on a business perspective, I totally agree, yes. Um, they've done everything they possibly can to support businesses, whether large or small. Um, and it was down to the businesses to make that decision whether or not they wanted to take on any of Ricky, uh, Ricky uh, Sunak's um, uh, advice. Um, and what we've done is we, 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 we took advantage of those situations. We, we uh, furloughed when we felt it was right to furlough. We've uh, followed the scheme and the government guidelines in terms of what we needed to do. And it's actually worked very well for our business. Uh, the challenge is going to be bringing those people back and how we bring them back and what do we do in terms of bringing them back and actually sustaining the, the growth of the business because that's going to become a huge cost to our business. Uh, when you've got a number of people that we have been furloughed, then coming back, how do you engage with them quickly enough for them to start earning revenues um, while, that, while we as a business take on 100% of their salary? So that's the next challenge moving on from us. I think, look, I think for all businesses, that next stage of how you bring people back and whatever is a really big challenge. Tanya, we've had a question. What happens if you have a furloughed member of staff that doesn't want to come back to the office? Now, pretty obviously, we're not putting people in offices yet. If you can work from home, you need to stay at home. What happens if you have an individual when the time comes that you want to move back to the office, but they you know, do not want to go back to the office. What can businesses do? Tanya? Um, I think you need, well, two things. There's the general point about doing everything you can that's practical to, practicable to make your offices safe. They don't have to be entirely safe, but you have to do what you can. And there's a very good risk assessment to help you do that as part of our unlocking the lockdown. The second thing is looking at each person each in individual um 
on a case by case basis to a certain amount. So last week we put up on the website a short questionnaire to try and gauge people's reactions and feelings about coming back to work. If you are very comfortable that the office is safe and this person can get to work without undergoing unacceptable risk, then I think you can expect them to return to the office um, and they don't have an absolute right. They certainly don't have an absolute right to stay on furlough, um, but they also don't have an absolute right to refuse to return. Now, ultimately, you could go down the disciplinary route, but that's pretty much, the, you know, you're not going to want to do that with a huge swathe of your employees. So it will be about communication and discussion. Um, but ultimately, no, they don't have a right to just stay at home on furlough or indeed stay at home unpaid for that matter um, if, they're, if they refuse to come back. But you have to take individual circumstances into account because they might have health concerns, etc. Can I, oh. Anne, can I ask, Ty, can I ask Tanya a question on the back of that? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I was just wondering then. So on that point then, then Tanya, if, for example, that, that employee then chooses not to come back, could a business then effectively then say, right, you, we've looked at your personal circumstances, you've made that decision now. What if we turn around and said, you have to now take any days that you sit at home as annual leave? Is that something that they can do? Um, you as an employer can make people take annual leave if you give them twice the notice um, that of the leave that they're going to take. So right. yes, you can, you do, but obviously people don't have endless amounts of annual leave to take. But once that they? annual leave then, Tanya, is then finished, once they've completed it and they've used maybe their three weeks, four weeks, whatever they've been given, could you then go to unpaid leave? Well, I mean, there, it then comes the situation where people, you know, the deal of employment is you provide work, people do work. I mean, if, if, if they had some credible reason for their concerns and they could continue to work from home, then obviously it would be more reasonable to allow them to continue to work from home. Um, if they really didn't and they were just being very... Um, difficult about it then potentially you know you could move towards dismissal um, because they're not fulfilling their side of the bargain but as I said you're going to really want to try and reach agreement with people before that of course breaks. otherwise it'll create quite an you, unpleasant environment yeah that was a specific question have you had anybody that stated a, a worry about coming back to the office at some stage yeah, of course we have, and we're going to get a number of people that will. And obviously, like we were just saying, and Tanya was just just noting there, we have to take it on a case by case basis. There are obviously got to be some really good reasons as to why that is the case, and it could well be that that individual has elderly parents at home, and they're still living at home, and they don't want to be in an environment where they're taking perhaps a train into London or a tube or a bus, whatever the case may be, and feels that 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 if they do that, they're exposing themselves government guidelines at the moment as we know is to stay at home but should we decide to move forward then how do we ensure that we create that safety for them to be able to travel to and from work that's going to be difficult for us and if they choose not to then businesses like ours are going to have to make that decision what do we do with that staff member how do we manage that that process and that's why I was keen to understand I'm sure some of our listeners today would have probably asked a similar question and wanted to know you know can we basically say you have to take holiday leave or can we go unpaid or do we go down the disciplinary route so it's an interesting one for us and I think you know whether you're a large or small organization you're going to have an individual or two or however many who are going to say well actually I'm not ready to come back for these reasons yeah Terry do you, have you have you had any of your members of staff you followed about a third of them have anyone said they're twitchy or definitely don't want to come back no, not yet. Um, some are twitching, wanting to come back. Um, a few, uh, again, the individuals um, own, you know, circumstances working from home. Um, but, um, you know, we've asked a question and everybody's happy uh, at the moment to maintain, you know, working from home that we've got. So 
we haven't yet gone down the route of saying we're going to you know look to come back at a certain time um you know we're not we're not going to come back before july so uh, but we're working this month to see what that potential looks like and uh, in that time in this month we'll we'll find out more about what the attitude is like for everybody um, but at the minute we can work from home so you know I, I think there's another kind of sentiment out there that some furloughed people are enjoying the furloughed time and maybe don't want to return to work even um, I, I think you know if you if you to say you're coming off furlough and you're working from home I can't see that anyone would have an, a, a, a valid argument against that uh, so they work from home they're, they're working um, and if your business can support that then then you know that's one way of at least getting back into that process. It's going to be a big mindset shift for a lot of people to come from completely being furloughed into working five days a week, for example. So maybe um, there's also a phased reintroduction, which is obviously what we're thinking about as well, especially with the part-time uh, offering that's coming up in July. And I think we, we've already been talking about that as to, you know, stages that we can take with different people um, and getting them back into the swing of it. Yeah. Uh, the part-time element is from August, actually, Tanya, is it? Or is it from July? July. Um, the part-time element is from the 1st of July. It it's okay, it's great. the contribution to the furlough pay that's, um, that's tapered from the 1st of August down to the end of October. Yeah. And that could be, as Terry said, a very useful way of starting winding people in to working again because you know a few months of not working it's going to be quite difficult from one straight to the other isn't it and I wonder whether the problems with perhaps somebody not wanting to come back is all about you know there are some people who are more twitchy let's say more anxious than others and mm. it's about how they can be managed and how we're managing them what are you doing, Andrew, with your team from uh, managing them even while they're on furlough and that kind of mental health scenario? What's yeah. a business on the scale of Pertemps doing to look after the, the anxieties, I'd say, of, of its members of staff? Look, the health and well-being of our staff is absolutely paramount. There's no two ways about it. And, uh, you know, they're the life and soul. They're the heartbeat of the business. And we need to ensure that we're looking after those individuals. And a lot has been spoken about, you know, mental health and how we deal with it. We just had Mental Health Week last week. It's a, uh, one of our, our charities, uh, you know, Mind is, is one of the, the nominated charities that Pertemp supports. It's hugely uh, high on my agenda to ensure that their health and well-being is, is, is looked after. Um, you know, we constantly, a, 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 a business like ours has several different leaders, several different MDs, and those MDs look after those divisions. And if you look at mine in specific, you know, I have uh, conference calls with my team every single day. We have Zoom calls and Teams calls with individuals, so we get to also see them. And we also talk to them on a very personal level as well. So I have individual calls with them, private calls, to ensure that things are okay. And you know what, that that's, communication is the key here. Understanding the environment that they're currently in, what they're feeling, allowing them to open up and to speak to you. We've known each other for a long, long time, uh, particularly the people within my team, to ensure that they are able to uh, approach me and to be able to speak to me honestly, um, and to ensure that they uh, understand that I have their, 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 their best um, in mind. So for us, it's really a case of communication. Uh, it's a case of understanding. And it's, it's a case of us really just making sure that those individuals when they are asked to come back we've got a real clear idea why if they are objecting they're objecting and if they don't making our offices covid secure for them to come back to create that that self and well-being that we've already stated yeah i mean i think if you look after your staff and you go through risk assessments and you do everything in your power to make your environment as safe as it can be then it's about trust isn't it and it i think is. that the more you look after your stuff the more likely they are to trust um tonya mentioned just a moment ago about the um unlocking lockdown paper that we have on the apsco um website it's in the corona resource hub do have a look at that for anybody out there it's something that we worked alongside squire pattern bogs with there is a weighty term talking about unlocking the lockdown everything you need to do 
part of that and now as a separate thing so less of a weighty term there's also simply the risk assessment we've been using it a lot of our members have been using it it's really really good it's there it's free of charge for members and i think squire pattern box has done a fantastic job on that so do look at it do download it and there is no reason to be looking at anything else you'll find it hugely useful terry from your your staff have you been thinking about their mental health have you had people and obviously we don't need to know specifics but have you had people that have been more anxious than others that have need a bit more looking after yes i'm sure everybody has as well um so again as andrew says uh, communication is the key um, trying to keep people engaged, so those that are, that are working, uh, but also those that have been furloughed to not forget about them. Um, we, uh, on the first week, we, we had a, a Zoom party on, the, on a Friday afternoon. We said, well, we're going to close at three o'clock. Let's get some drinks out. Let's get some funny hats. So each week we've had a different theme. We've been doing that. I even bought some decks so I could do some DJing and one of my other directors kind of is a bit of dab hand at that as well. So we've, we've been having some fun. Uh, we had to cancel our annual award ceremony. So, hey, we did a virtual award ceremony and we all got dressed up in black tie and <laughs> we had a, the, um, you know, again, just to try and keep people engaged, entertained um, and just uh, feel part of the business, even though, um, you know, uh, we're not all in the office and, and it's a very different experience. But, you know, we, we've adapted to this, I think. I'm sure the majority of us have adapted uh, to the new way of working and the new way of communicating and, and keeping everybody involved. Do you think this new way of working that we've all adapted to means that you would change from an old way of working when you do come back to the office terry what, what are you going to are you going to do things differently will there be more flexibility about people working from home here and there i think there will and um, we've always offered it nobody's ever took it up i guess it's because it's different and unknown some people throughout this process will have uh, you know certainly had better experiences than others as to what they have at home um but one thing that's and what we've also seen is some people have actually um flourished when they're not being in the office you know recruitment's a very confident environment and you know perhaps some alpha males and females in the office and other people kind of don't flourish in the same way in when they've got those people sat around them but you know when they're at home and they're on they, they, they've come out of their shell um and uh, and flourished so yeah i i would think that you know for a number of reasons but but the fact that you've tried it and it's been forced upon us i think then we'll start to see something different um, yeah, good. And, and Andrew, you mentioned that you'd look maybe at hot desking in some other ways. Yeah. Have you? Do you feel that you, as an individual, as an MD level and director of a huge company, do you think you flourish personally working at home, or less so? It's been it's a mixed bag, really, Anne, to be perfectly honest. There's been days when I've absolutely loved being here and enjoyed the idea of having my puppy around me and, you know, being able to take a break when I want to and not have the, the noise of the office sometimes so I can get on with my work. But there's other times I've absolutely missed it. I'm a social animal that enjoys the interaction of other people around them. And going into an office and getting that buzz and listening to the phones going and listening to my guys really going at it it's such a pleasure. I've been doing this now for 28 years now, and it's something that I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. So it's going to be difficult. And I suppose I'm, I, I was prior to COVID, one of these managers that always was very skeptical, skeptical about people working from home. And I have, and I'm going to admit now to the world, I've changed my mind. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had a director of mine make a proposal to me that we should be going to a four day week. I was going, no, don't be silly. How can we do that? We need to, we're, we're, you know, we're recruitment consultants. We need to be five days a week available. And, and, you know, she was absolutely adamant, wrote a paper, explained to me how this would work. And we're at that point at board level trying to decide, do we go down that route or not? You know, I'm sure these discussions will continue once we return at the end of, uh, of, of, of this emergency. And I suppose my, my feeling has changed as well. And, uh, I know I've got some decisions to make around how I'm going to work, not only personally, but for my team and what that means for them. Um, it's been a really interesting time. I think a lot of us have learned a lot about ourselves during this time, really, and obviously spending time with the family as well uh, and, and just in, enjoying really the environment as well, the fresh air. 
and not having to travel on crowded tubes. Just so much has been going on. So it's been very up and down. It just depends really, I guess, Anne. Okay, well, that, I think that's a very honest thing. Although now you've said to the whole of the, the recruitment market out there that you've changed your mind and maybe four day a week's going to work. There's hardly any going back, mate. You've got no chance. No, it's, Tanya, it's... can I come to you with a question? Um, I was wondering what Tanya had heard about the reverse charge VAT for construction and whether it's likely to be delayed again. Any news on that? Right, I've just had a little look while I've been on. Um, we will update our guidance on this actually. It looks like it's coming into force on the 1st of October 2020. Um, and that's government updates really quite recently within the last month or so. So we will um, speak to Safri as well, who did an update for us last time. And if there is more news, then we will get it up on the website and communicated but it looks like October October time okay another question I'm going to come to you my employees who were not furloughed took salary cuts of 20% is it possible to bring furloughed people back with their agreement on a reduced salary i.e. 80% yeah, this is the query that I was um, a bit more context around that, that question I was talking about um, earlier. I think if employees working have taken, it's, it's too, it sounds like it could be reasonable as long as there's agreement. It does seem unfair that people haven't been furloughed, are getting paid 80%. And people that have been furloughed when they work are being paid 100%. That, that does seem unfair. It seems like, you know, the same should be applied. It's impossible to tell at the moment until the guidance comes out on the 12th of June. Even then, it might not be that specific. But I think I'd then be able to give a clearer view on that. But I suppose if there is actual consent to a salary cut then, and it is consistent with other people then potentially it could be fine and won't invalidate the furlough that's what I'm concerned about you don't want to do anything to invalidate the furlough payment and I, no, I, fair I, enough have we heard oh sorry Terry um so just thinking of how things could play out if you had workers that are working on 80% because they've agreed to take a pay cut to continue working. If you've got furloughed employees that are at home on 80%, and obviously that's the mechanism is in place to pay that, um, going forward, could, as an employer, you, um, you don't have to pay the full 80%, I, I assume. And if maybe if you said, well, okay, moving forward from now, we'll reduce our 80% to 50%, let's say, for example, in the or 60 percent um to try and balance the difference between workers either staying on furlough because they want to and they love the 80 percent for doing not a lot or um actually you know what i'm going to come back to work and get 80 percent because that's better than staying at home and getting 50 percent uh, tanya my understanding is that a worker needs to get 80 percent of their salary whatever happens don't they yeah i don't think you can agree to pay a reduced furlough. No, my, so my understanding, Terry, is that a, an employee even on, you know, on furlough needs to earn 80% of what, uh, yeah, up to yeah. two and a half grand, they need to earn 80% in order to cover their bills and things like that. So if the government are paying less, you cannot pay them less than 80% and then still be furloughed. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think I think that's right, isn't it, Tanya? Yeah. yeah. I can see it causing yeah. a problem though for those that have got you know, staff on on reduced salaries. You know, there's, there there all needs to be some of the mechanism that would help uh, help those employers in that situation. Yeah, let's come to some more questions because we're going to run out of time soon, which is um, great to get these questions in. Tonya, do you have any updates? And I might come to Andrew on this as well, but Tonya first, do you have any updates around supply teachers qualifying for furlough payments after the summer term has finished during that six week summer holiday? Any news on that? Well, 
I mean, BASE and employment agency standards have been very clear that you can furlough teachers during holiday periods. So I don't, I think that will continue to apply. The issue I see is that the agency will have to find the employer's national insurance and pension contributions from the 1st of August. So there is a cost associated. Yeah. Andrew, are you likely to get involved in furloughing teachers through that summer holiday period if they can be furloughed? I wasn't aware that you could do that. So what Tanya's just said to me is news to me. I thought they would only be furloughed until the 21st of July when term ends. But I need to look into that. I'm unaware. I was unaware of that. So that's something I need to look into. Okay, I've got a detailed question here, which is really repeating something that you've given guidance on, Tanya. So bear with me. But can we just make it very tight for somebody to uh, to recognize the answer this is the question i'm going to read it taking into account the minimum three week furlough period the final date by which an employer can furlough an employee for the first time will be the 10th of june in order for the current three week furlough period to be completed by the 30th of june employers will have until the 31st of july to make any claims in respect of a period to the 30th of June. What does this mean for anyone who may have been brought back from furlough temporarily mid-June to cover holiday but won't have been furloughed continuously in the three weeks running up to the 30th of June? Um, the, I, I think as long as they've been furloughed for a three week period at some point before the 30th of June, then they will fit within the pool of people that can continue to be paid furlough after the 30th of June. Yeah, okay, so clear for everybody. Um, here's another question. Tanya, first of all, I'm gonna to come to you and then I'll come over to, to my other members of the panel. If someone is earning 40K and works four days, am I right in thinking they would not be eligible for the fourth day as this would take them over 2,500, which of course is 80% of a salary. My understanding is 37 and a half grand, isn't it? So um, if the five days not work, yeah. would it take them over 2,500? Can no. you just clarify that? So what's been announced doesn't give a view on that. So that's so I'll raise it with the EAS. It's a very good point. I'd assumed that it will be a pro rata so that just because but we need to take it to EAS. We need to make sure it's covered in the guidance, basically, which I suspect it will do. What's been announced so far, it doesn't actually answer answer that question it just says when they're working they're paid 100 percent when they're not working they can be paid furlough it does not there's no explanation of the interaction between their salary rate and the furlough rate so we'll raise and it so with once, the AM. once we find that out from the employment agency standards authority we will release that in the bulletin keep your eye whoever asked that for Nick uh, Pusey, have a look on the bulletin. We will announce that for you and let you know. A very quick answer to this, Tanya. Do you have any details yet regarding any guarantees or support for apprentices? Um, off the top of my head, I know they are part of the furlough scheme. Um, perhaps that person could actually email the legal help desk giving a bit more information about what they're looking for. Um, okay, so don't forget everyone out there, the AMSCO legal help desk is around to answer these kind, kind of questions, but sometimes we need that little bit more detail than perhaps a question in this format can provide. Um, let me come to my panel members because we're coming toward our end quickly. Andrew, How's the business going to move forward? We've probably got Brexit at the end of the year. Who knows? But we probably do. Are the plans big? Are the plans still there for growth and expansion to next year for Pertemps? 
Simple, the very, very quick answer is, of course, yes, it is. Yes, um, we obviously need to get over the emergency that we're currently going through. We need to establish exactly where we are with that. We need to have all of our staff back in offices at some point during the autumn term. Uh, and then for us then to look at what we're going to be doing for 2021. Uh, we've not looked or reviewed our 2021 plans yet. Uh, I think the key thing is the here and now, uh, but there's no reason why we shouldn't continue to, to uh, you know, to, to grow. Look, we've been, we're a huge liner that's been blown off course. We need to get back on course and it's going to take the whole of 2021 to do that. So once we've done that, we'll continue to plough on as, as we normally do. Great. Terry, what are your expansion plans? Are they to new markets? Are they more in the same markets? What are the expansion plans for astute technical recruitment in order to survive, but also to thrive as we move forward? Um, so uh, overseas, uh, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, you know, went on the um, uh, the, the app school trade delegation at the end of last year. Um, also looking at Australia. So I, I'd been to Australia in February, um, with regards to um, you know doing business over there, it's just very pertinent to to our business right now. Um, but then, obviously, the whole world turned upside down. Um, so, realistically, for me, you know, this year that we're in now, and not whilst we're right at the beginning of it, you know, month um, three of, of of the year plan. Um, again, so the business plan gets kind of ripped up for us, and we're just going to survive and get through it. Uh, we're doing better than than maybe initially expected. Uh, my view, where we're at uh, in business and we have a plan, is that by the end of the year and start of the next financial year, if we're going into that the way we went into this one at the same level, then I'll be happy. So perhaps a, a, a slightly uh, more pessimistic view than yours, Andrew, in terms of maybe you know what we expect from this year, but I'll be happy if we get there. And this year would then have been an unfortunate blip in our plan, a long, a long blip, of course, but, you know, if we can do better than that, fantastic. But I'm, I'm also, you know, very uh, widely aware that there'll be a lot of members and, and within APSCO that won't even be in that situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we can get there, we'll be good. We started off this calendar year really strong after 2019. Um, and like I say, the whole world turns upside down. Thank you. Let me thank everybody who's tuned in to listen to us today. Let me thank you to my panellists. To Andrew Anastasiu, Anastasiu, for some of us, Terry Buckle, and who have been fantastic, and always Tanya Bowers. Let me thank you for tuning in. I hope you're getting a flavour of what businesses are doing out there, all of us in very similar situations, and how we get back on our feet, how the recruitment market will continue, there is no question about it, and the tweaks that we need to make to carry our businesses forward. Thank you for that. Let me just remind everybody that at two o'clock today, there is a fantastic um, webinar delivered by Mike Lander, who's a procurement expert. He's gonna talk about negotiating with professional recruitment buyers, especially at this moment in time. And then on Thursday at two o'clock, we also have um, the APSCO Global Chairman, Mars Hunt, who's gonna talk about leadership in ties of crisis, specifically looking on an international basis. You'll know from looking at the bulletin, there are so many things going on at APSCO. Have a look, I can't cover them all today. We're a bit over our time, but I want to thank you for joining us. And I will speak to you again on Tuesday. Thank you everybody. Thank you to our panel members. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks Bye. everyone. Thank you.